just a quick intro. Obviously, thanks for jumping on Level Up Run, my new channel. George, uh, it's just great to have you on. Well, great to see you again, Matt. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to looking forward to catching up. And, uh, before we kicked off this, we had a chance to start our conversations. We were just talking about some running, and and I wanted to hit record because there's so many good things that come up in these conversations. Uh, and I just couldn't wait to get you on and just talk to you about it because it's fascinating to me. Uh, we talked about how you wear many hats. So I'd love to hear how you went from a chemical engineer to a multivitamin specialist. Yeah, yeah it, it, and it's something that um, it's something that I never intended to do. I, I never intended to to start a business. I never intended to uh, be the face of a business or to have you know so many runners that that I work with today. It just kind of happened. Um, I started my career as a chemical engineer. Uh, I worked at Procter & Gamble making diapers. Uh, and then I also spent some time at, when I was at Georgia Tech, working in the chemical lab. And then from there, just sort of migrated. So did engineering for a while, then I moved on to operations and other parts of the business. And that was sort of what I was doing. And right when I turned 40, I started paying a lot more attention to different aspects of my life. Um, at that point I had kids. And so the only hobby that I kept was, was running. Um, so running was the big hobby that I had. I started paying a lot more attention to nutrition and I put together a really good nutritional program. I was eating well, I thought, um, it could be better, but I was also taking a bunch of different supplements. I had a supplement routine of about eight to 12 different bottles and it worked great. It was exactly what I wanted to go do, but it was cumbersome. There's was a lot of bottles taking up cabinet space. It took up time, it took up money, things were rattling around in the gym bag. And I said, I, you know, I should be able to simplify this. I have the background from my time as an engineer that I could be able to make this a little bit easier. And so I sat down, wrote out the formula that I thought would make sense for me as a runner, because most vitamins and supplements aren't geared for runners, they're geared for just the everyday adult. And that's a great market to go to because there's a bunch of people that can all benefit from it. But runners are different. We sweat more, we move more, we're more active, we work our muscles and joints harder than just some other people that you know that aren't runners. And so I thought, well, I could have designed something that I needed as a runner, and that's what I did. So about five years ago, I made 48 bottles, which was a two year supply just for me. And then one Thanksgiving about five years ago, I distinctly remember it. I put it on Amazon just to see what would happen. And a lady purchased it. And I thought it was the most <laughs> crazy feeling in the world that someone was interested in something that I made for myself. And it turns out there are a bunch of people. There's a bunch of runners that can benefit from it, that have benefited from it. Fast forward five years, have sold over 3 million vitamins to thousands of runners across the US. And that first customer is still a customer. You know, and, and you hit so many nails on the head with that conversation, just the intro right there, because I, as a runner, as someone who's worked out and as somebody who's chased the dream of whatever, I have shelves of multivitamins that have expired. I have all the other stuff that I have tried. I have bought bottles that were $10, $30, $50, whatever, and taken a few and been like, ah, you know, this isn't for me. And that's part of it. It's, it's you know, runners and, and people who are become this elitist in, in different level of races are just the, the 5K or, or just somebody who just wants health. We're so hyper-focused. Uh, the reason I came across you was just that. I, I wasn't, wasn't settled on what I had. I just knew it wasn't right. So I continued looking. And then, you know, just that you're in the field, that you are a runner, that you understand and that you geared this towards running really locked it in like okay here's something i really want to try and that that was a huge point for me to to jump on board i guess the transition from chemical engineer into multivitamin there had to be a little bit of a learning curve there there had to be a little bit of a hmm, how do i get from an idea to a proof of concept how was that formed it was very difficult um because like i said i wasn't trying to start a business i wasn't trying to uh, build anything. I was just trying to make something for myself. And so it took probably, or well, maybe almost two years to go from the part where I wrote down what I was looking for to be able to bring it to life. It was important to me to work with someone that was US based. And so that became a key part of it. And then also 
use great quality ingredients. And that was difficult to find. But eventually, you know, and I was working. I had a full-time job. That's what I was doing. I had a family to take care of. That was sort of the focus. And so I, it took a while. It wasn't a huge, um, you know, it wasn't a lot of urgency, but eventually I was able to pull it together and create it in it and, you know, found a great manufacturer was able to bring my product to life. And like I said, only made 48 bottles just for myself because I wasn't trying to scale an enterprise. I was just trying to scratch my own itch. Um, but yeah, Matt, it's a great question because I didn't have a lot of experience in, in doing that. Um, but I did have experience as a runner and I had experience in nutrition and what I was looking for. And then I was able to work with experts, some of the best experts, I think, in the country on bringing that product to life. And then from there, honestly, it's been easy because the key thing is every day I get to talk to people that I enjoy being around, which is other runners. Um, I enjoy having conversations with, with you and all of our other runners. I just spoke to a gentleman yesterday who's also a Peregrine runner who's about to run the Moab 240. Mm -hmm. And he's doing that at 62 years old, just finished through hiking the Appalachian Trail. And I thought to myself, wow. And that's been one of the best parts of this whole experience is um, what our brand, what Peregrine, who we work with is what I like to call the citizen runner. It's, it's yep. the people that are, that are like us, that we're raising a family, we're holding down a job, uh, we're trying to do hobbies on the side, and we're trying to balance it all with still chasing running goals. You know, some of us win races, some of our runners do win races, and we have some professional and college athletes with us. Well, sorry, some college athletes with us. And that's great. But most of us don't do that. We're, we're just trying to balance it all together. And one of the things that I love to do is put a spotlight on those stories and hear from those runners. Because to me, I think those are the, the real heroes, the people that are able to do all the things that they do and still find time whenever to go run. That's really, I think, the story to be told. Yeah, no, I, and it, it's so evident in just your website. You know, I, I encourage everybody to, and I'll link to everything below and uh, get everybody right to your site because just the stories that you have on there. And it's just that it's, you know, myself, I'm a father, I'm an IT guy. I had, you know, I love bass fishing and I have another YouTube channel that I started up for that. And then I have this one and, you know, I'm just out there doing stuff just to have fun with it. And what I find extremely infectious is when someone of your passion and drive starts to link these other components together. And for all of us who have been to a race that's, you know, a couple hundred people or whatever, you start to, it, it's a beehive of activity and it's everybody doing the same thing in a harmonious way. Uh, and and it, I've never found that with anything else. And, you know, my past race was just that. It was like, in such a tough time of the world, when you get enough like-minded people together and you just are part of a group and no one cares about anything else going on, just what you're doing as that task. Uh, so that's where running really brings it together and, and just your personality and your drive for this, it, it really is infectious. And I think that you can see that in the products as well. So for the products, so what do you consider your key facets? What do you like to... Uh, what's your elevator speech for your uh, different products? What do you like to get out there? So w w the, the first thing that I always say is that I, I think nutrition is such an important part of running. And it's an, a part of running that is often overlooked and isn't focused on as much maybe until you are older and you start paying more attention to it out of necessity. Uh, it's something that I wish I, I would have paid more attention to even younger. Um, yep. But that's the first thing I think in nutrition is very important. And because of that, what I say is that I think everybody should be taking a multivitamin. Um, even if you don't take peregrine multivitamin, if you take something else, that's great. I, I think it's just such a useful thing to add to your diet, to add diversity, because most of us are busy. Most of us don't eat as well as we should every single day. Most of us no, we should always eat fresh fruit, vegetables to get our nutrients. There's no question about that. Are you trying to say <laughs> pizza and beer are not part of the everyday diet? Because that's you know, a great, that's a part of my diet, and I tell you what, that's <laughs> except for the beer, that's a big part of my kids' diet as well. And so, um, 
But yes, I mean, that's a part of diet and that's part of it. And so it's, you know, life. Taking, it's life. And I think, you know, taking a multivitamin just helps with that because it adds nutrient diversity. And so that's the first thing. Now, if you are taking a multivitamin and you're a runner, what I would say is the reason why I think you should consider taking Peregrine is that we're different. We're designed for runners. And the way we're different is that we first and foremost start with a probiotic at its core. That's already different than most other vitamins. And that's to really help with your gut health and absorb the nutrients that you are taking. And you're probably taking a lot more nutrients as a runner and need that more than most adults. Second thing is, is that it is a complete vitamin B. It has all 12 B vitamins at concentrated levels. The B vitamins were the first ones that were discovered. And those are the vitamins that are critical to the ATP creation process, which is how the cells and muscles create energy in the mitochondria. And so that is a key focus of the vitamin. That also is very different than most mainstream ones. Next, it has three times the amount of antioxidants, vitamin C and E. Vitamin C is the water soluble component. Vitamin E is fat soluble. And so we have both for the balance. And then there's vitamin D, other key minerals, and it's all wrapped in 42 fruits and vegetables that add additional nutrient diversity to your pizza, to my pizza and beer diet, as well as the help of the absorption of the vitamin. Um, GMP certified quality ingredients. We publish our transparent ingredients on our website for anyone that's interested in our product, our formulated and bottled in the United States. And your, your last race was the the anchor down. Was I'm, Was that your first 100K that you've completed, or had you completed other 100K distances before in a race? Yeah, so this one was, uh, I've done multiple, I guess, 30 milers. I've done uh, two 50 milers. Uh, this was my first attempt. It was labeled as the Anchor Down Ultra 24 hour race. Uh, the ultimate goal, I kind of consider it three tiers. There's the belt buckle goal, which is the 100 miles in 24 hours. There's the goal of making it 24 hours, and then there's beating whatever you can beat in 24 hours. So to be considered an ultra for this event, you had to complete 52 miles or, or 50 miles or more. Um, so for myself, what I ended up doing was I completed a 100K, which is about 62 miles. Uh, we started at 7 p.m. at night, carried through the night, and I think I wrapped up probably around 11 o'clock. I had 50 miles by 7 a.m., uh, and then the variable for this race, it's a 2.45 mile loop along the waterfront in Rhode Island in August. So the heat is 100% the factor. Throughout oh. the entire night, the amount of humidity and the, the stillness of the air in the woods, because it's about a mile and a half through the woods and then it's pavement, um, it was just, I was pouring sweat. Just, I could feel it oozing out of me. I was drinking more water than I probably drank two gallons of water just through the night. Uh, and then the morning, the sun cracks and it's that high heat. So as it continued to that lunchtime hour, I hit my goal of 100K uh, and I was quite content with my goal. I achieved it, my personal best. And now I can actually assess and say, how do I get to my next goal? So it was yeah. a true test. It was an amazing race uh, to just to be, uh, you know, moving for 15 straight hours, cranking away uh, and nutrition through the night and hydration through the night. So it's all all that gigantic formula that runners try to build. You know, I have my cheat sheet next to me. I got to decompress everything that I did for the race. I broke down my nutrition uh, for every four laps what I needed. And it, you know, they always say have plan A, have plan B, have plan C. And when those fail, have three more because nothing is ever the same, you know? Great. Um, what an accomplishment. Congratulations for doing that. And the nutrition part is interesting. I just spoke with another one of our runners who just got done summiting Mount Denali. And he, to do that, I, I didn't realize this. I, I, didn't have, I don't have any experience mountain climbing. Um, but he uses running as his basis for training for, for a bunch of things, including uh, mountaineering. But to climb, climb Denali, it's a two to three week process where a plane yeah. drops you off on a glacier in the middle of nowhere and it, it, you're there. And so it was him and his longtime climbing partner 
and they each had 100 pounds of gear with them, packs of 100 pounds. They have a sled to help pull it. But a big part of that is bringing your food. And so I asked them, I was like, well, what do you, like, what do you eat for two weeks to fuel a mountain climbing endeavor? Yeah. And what he said to me was that he's like, honestly, it's not the most healthy stuff in the world. It's very high fat because a gram of fat has eight calories compared to a gram of carbs. And so it's just slow release energy. And I thought that was really interesting. And so I was going to ask, um, a big part of running ultras is, is the nutrition. That's sort of the, that's sort of like the, the other leg of it is that you, you, at that point you actually have to, you have to eat, you have to put calories in your yep. body. So how do you, how do you think about the calories that you eat on an ultra? Is it like, would you have a steak or is, is a protein intake a bad idea and it's all sugar, but can your stomach handle all sugar? So conveniently enough, like I'm saying, I have, I'll see what I got here. If this is the bin, I got all my race gear that I took out of the car. So what I ended up doing was, um, and the great thing about races and the different formats, all the ones that I did and all the ones that I've done usually have some sort of support system. There's a water tent, there's a snack tent, there's uh, anything from, you know, the typical, you know, quote unquote, goos and the packs. Um, but a lot of times uh, pizza shows up and they have, you know, uh, uh, one of the tents halfway through the race will have gummy bears and Skittles and uh, enchiladas or, uh, you know, <laughs> ramen noodles and broth are sometimes the best thing you can ever have for the sodium um but for a few of the races i've done which have been point to point you're self-sufficient so you have to have everything ready so what i ended up doing for this one <laughs> this is this is the aftermath but it's just the list of my laps and the times projected to be on them and then yeah. i had numbers corresponding for well, the numbers corresponding with each one in my race bin what I did was I lined them up with the lap number and the time that I should be there. So I knew plus or minus, and then my different fruit packets with electrolytes with, uh, you know, <laughs> Advil and some, um, but I balanced out the sodium. I balanced out the, um, the, the caffeine, cause that's another one you have to, you know, caffeine's a natural accelerant for the, you know, getting through these races. But I really started to look at, where are the typical highs and lows? Uh, and then to be honest, mixing in with this, this was the base. I always mix in real food. Um, I love, they're called nons. They're like the, the stone crushed bread with the hummus. Uh, mm -hmm. That's like one of my go-tos during races. Uh, <laughs> most of my friends have fun with me because I always have a clementine in my pocket. I live on clementines. Like I will just, I'll just pull it out and eat it while I'm running because they peel and eat great. Um, I try to stay to natural foods, um, and while there's a place for the additives like Tailwind and, and different things like that that are going to give you that quick punch, um, for me, those really give me some dietary issues. Uh, so I, I like these are all natural. They're the H-U-M-A, Huma packs, yeah. and it's just, it's just fruit. It's just blended fruits and natural stuff, uh, all vegan-friendly if you're going down that route, gluten-free. Um, and they just really settle my stomach and it's not that potency of some of this other stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I love that because one of the things that, that I noticed about a lot of runners is that the first thing we always think about, and maybe the only thing is what I call kind of race nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so most of us, we know a lot about that. And so we, ha we all have our perspectives on what's the right goo or the right energy gel for a race or uh, the right, the right mix of things for, you know, for their event, like an ultra run, everybody has a perspective on that because that is critical, right? During your, that's race day performance. And last year, back in December, every year in Austin, Texas, the, they have the, the running event. It's uh, the largest expo where all the running stores that uh, are in your area most likely come to. And different vendors go to and meet running meet, meet different running stores and i went last year just for the first time with the company with peregrine just to meet a bunch of different running stores and yep. what was really interesting about it was that 
of all the people I talked to, except for one, and so all the different buyers at the stores, all of them had what I call the nutrition section of their store. And all of them had a focus on race state nutrition. But basically no one had a focus on what I called everyday nutrition. And that's what the multivitamin and the joint support and the omega is that yes, it is critical to get your lights and your calories during the race, no question. But just like you carb load before probably an ultra, I would imagine, uh, definitely a marathon, just like you carb load before those events, there is a lot you can do outside of running that can help your recovery so that you can perform better during your training, during the race, and just your everyday life. And that's sort of this idea of everyday nutrition that Peregrine operates in to complement the humans of the world, to complement the tailwinds that are really focused on, you know, performing your best on that day. Yeah. And, and two key topics that I take away from that is race day nutrition shouldn't be that different from your weekend nutrition shouldn't be that different from your week run um i i've seen it so many times where people will go into a run and they'll they'll somebody said try this somebody said yes. take this or now i'm gonna live on goo for 12 hours and not you know just any any brand packet of you know nutrition and what ends up happening is it knocks them out it, it you know there's so many things can go wrong in a run if you change your routine and multivitamins you know what i tried to do for this race is i made sure i had uh, you know two batches of them i went through one months in advance and then i got onto this one for this month because i didn't want it new in my system and that's when i reached out to you i think it was probably about two months ago uh -huh. uh, and really had to get that second supply in because it, you want it in your system you want it to be a normal thing because if you upset that balance your body tells you so we put all this effort into running. We put all this effort into, you know, mountain climbing and, and some of these adventures of, of people that you've talked to. And no matter what it is, if it's your, I don't even know how to word it. Like I'll go back to my heart rate stuff. I love heart rate monitor. If you're somebody just starting and you walk out the door and you run a 5K, you are maxing out your life. You are intense. You are getting to it. Or you're the gentleman you just talked about who's going on a two to three week mountain climb beyond expectations. He's maxing out his. There's really no difference between the two for the scale. Person A is just starting and they're maxing their self out. He's been training forever. Now he's going to push his limits. As long as you're testing your limits and you're really trying to get better at what you're doing, you're always going to hit that wall. But what can you do to get past that wall? And you know, unlocking it with the multivitamins was key for me because I didn't have that in it. So that's another piece, another thing that allows me to get to that next level. While I completed a couple of 50 milers, this was the first 100K that I've done. Now I can set my sights on what's next. And you're in the race, you, 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 I'm never going to do this again. Why would I do this? And then you get home and you're like, okay, what can I register for? What's out there? You know, or am yeah. I going to do this one next year? But these are all formulas. These are that genetic makeup of who we are and why we do what we do. Running is left foot, right foot, repeat. So what's yeah. the difference if it's to the stop sign at the bottom of the hill that I always talk about or if it's a 100K? Uh, so I really, really do appreciate people like yourself who dive into this and are the focus of our needs. I, the, the heart rate... Uh training i think is also really fascinating and interesting when you train for an ultra do you how much time do you spend sort of in um call it like the zone one zone two or call it like zone two aerobic range versus yep. doing it, it is because for instance um for for a lot of our runners that do marathons or they do 10ks or half marathons there is a big element of lactic threshold yes. and anaerobic training that goes into the mix to help you go faster and faster and faster I, i've always wondered how much of that is a part of your training for an ultra race if at all so it's a big part of the training and i'll kind of tell this in reverse for the race i just did i purposefully shut off my heart rate monitor two reasons one i needed battery life 
uh, to make sure I didn't exceed the the you know capabilities of the watch. But two is that I've trained with it for so long now I can I I almost know where I'm at when I'm there. When you are training, you want to train to the point where you know your highs and lows and you want to ride that center line. But when you're running the race itself, it is a this one is a very strict 24 hours. You have to cross the finish line at 24 hours or what you that last lap doesn't count. So if you're going for the 100 miler and you have, you know, your lap times are, let's say, you know, creeping up to 45 minutes or whatever, and you're not starting at that right interval, you, can't, you don't even start the lap. You're not not going to count. Mm. Um, so for for me, I didn't have that concern because I was within the time thresholds. Uh, and I knew I was hitting my limit, so it was just part of it. But back to the training regimen with the heart rate, you have to know your max. So doing some hill intensities, doing some sprints, doing some something that really, when you're when you stop, your hands are on your knees and you're keeled over, and you're like, that's it, that's your peak. You you hit it. Now trying to figure out, okay, if I go out and I have a lesser intensity workout for a longer period of time, how can I sit at 145? For how long can I sit there and kind of get that pace? I feel like for myself, at least with heart rate, when I when I realized what my max was, it allowed me to then create a baseline of where my intensity is. So I have some trails over by me where um, you know, you get out of the car and the first thing you got to do is run up a hill, you know, it's like, oh God, you know, and as I started to watch those, I would say in the beginning of the season of training, or, you know, if I took a break or whatever, I'm hitting 170, 172, you know, 168 and I'm there as my training progressed and I mixed in multiple workouts and started coming full circle. I started to realize that, wow, that same out of the car start at that same location now is 155. 160, 155. Uh, and then the other key component for me is, yep, that's a hill. What happens at the top of the hill? So before I was at 170, I'm cranking away. And then it's 170, 170, 168, 160, you know, and, and staying peaked. Now I get to the top of the hill. I'm at 155, 160 at the most. And then it's boom, right back down to 145. So yeah. getting, getting your rhythms to come down is just as important as to know when they're high and when they're low. Now, ultra running is all about that endurance factor of how long can you go at that intensity. And different races have different, you know, uh, terrains and all that good stuff. But realistically, your baseline should be that I can walk, I can talk, I can breathe. I'm not overexerting. And that's the baseline. That's where you just want to stay. You know, there's ups and downs, but it's trying to find that balance. You know, yeah, that's information. Yeah, understanding that you have to first know what your max is before you can set your different zones. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. And I've had the experience before where knowing what my heart rate could be for an effort, and if I'm not there, I may be in a race or something, and I'm thinking to myself, "Oh wow, I, I'm really tired. This is the best I could go do." But my heart rate's like, well. Is it? And sometimes it's a nice little coach to be like, no, maybe you actually could put more out there because your mind's getting in the way or whatever it might be, but your body's telling you actually, no, we can, we can work harder. But if you don't, if you don't know what your, your max is from doing this different effort, then it's hard to know what you're capable of. Uh, yeah. If you've never seen kind of the peaks. And so I, I, ne I guess I never thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, right. Body psychology, race psychology, it's all there's millions of different avenues you can go through. But, you know, the brain is designed to put us into reserve. I say that all the time. You know, it's yeah. what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Stop, stop, stop. You know, even my last race, I had to laugh like I was. Oh, God, I don't even know, probably 15, 20 miles in. And my right knee got I have three screws in my left knee. So that one should be the one hurting me. But my right knee is usually fine. My right knee was banging. It was just I don't know what was going on. And I literally looked down at my knee and I just told it to shut up. <laughs> you know, I was like, just stop it. I, you know, this, you're going to, and I worked my way through it, but it's like, you know, the, all these things that, that come into play for running and racing and, and just that endurance aspect of it. But the body 
does equalize. And it's always saying, you know, reserve, 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 but you can bust through that wall and you can get a heck of a lot more out of it. Once you do though, you have to give yourself a minute to recover. You got to figure out how to get that baseline back down. Heart rate peaks, get it back down. You can't stay up there because you'll leave in an ambulance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I love, I mean, I love that story of, of, of kind of just telling your, your body to stop. And one of the gentlemen I spoke to, the same guy who just got done hiking the Appalachian Trail, one of the things he said was, I was like, well, how, how did you do that? How did you carry a 60 pound pack every day for 2000 miles? And he said, he said, your body can adapt to anything. I was like, that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. And he's like, it can adapt to carrying a 60 pound bag for 2000 miles. It can adapt to hiking, um, climbing a mountain for, for two weeks. It can adapt to, to doing a 24 hour trail race. And it can adapt to sitting at your desk all day and doing nothing. Yep. And it does. And I thought that was really interesting when he said that last part, because so many people will just adapt to their situation. And sometimes you can go outside your comfort zone. Like for instance, I haven't run an ultra marathon yet. And a big part of me says, well, I could never go do that. That just seems really hard. How could I ever go from, you know, having run no more than 26 miles to running like you just did for like that just seems crazy to me. But to your point, your body can adapt to it. It can adapt to the training. There are people who've done it before. There is advice you can follow, which is one of the reasons why I love your channel is because someone like me that was coming in have a lot of questions, right? I could probably sit down and list out 50 questions in a minute and being able to answer, having someone answer a lot of those questions for a beginner breaks down that barrier to entry and makes it seem more possible to do. It still seems really hard to do a 62 mile race. <laughs> it, well, we're the only ones who put limitations on ourselves. You know, that, that's really, the other yeah. piece of it. It, it. it really is. You know, I, I still look back and, and at the races that I've done and, uh, you know, I, I don't even consider myself a runner. And I say that all the time. And I don't mean that like it's mainly because I didn't want to go into this race assuming I was going to complete it because that to me would have been not right to the ones who train at that level that is beyond what I can train at. I'm the one running you know, after I put my daughter to bed, I, I right. go out and I run at night or I wake up at you know five and I go for a run or, you know, it's in between and I'm doing segment trainings just because that's what I can do. Um, and just to be able to accomplish something in that feeling at the end of it, uh, you know, it, it's fuel for the fire. You know, you said yet. So I think the seed might be planted where you could be looking on the horizon. Uh, it's, planted. And it's planted. It's just that thing, you know, my next race, uh, it's the Pemberton 24. Uh, so it's a 5k every hour for 24 hours and every 5k that you complete. Yeah, wow. every so every 5k you complete you get a point so you could do you know whatever you want so we have a you know my gym crew we have a group of i think 10 or 12 of us going down to this race uh and it's just a fun one now so it's like you pick those and then i always talk about the fit challenge a small circuit up near me that i love uh it's actually held at the cumberland monastery up in rhode island and it's a you know a five mile loop that you do and it's just the same people are always jumping in and you're in the trails talking to people, having fun with people. And it's that camaraderie and you don't even know you're putting on miles at a certain point. Yes. I always call it the bucket of suck. The bucket of suck is always there. There's always the hill. There's always that thing. Um, but you lose yourself in the run. And, you know, somebody, as I was talking about this past race, had asked me, what did you think about for 15 hours? And I really had to, I really had to pause because so much went through my head, but at the same token, there was that Nirvana time span where I was just list, just going. I mean, I didn't even listen to music for six or seven hours. You know, it was like, I didn't want to put it in. I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose the run. I wanted to be part of it. Um, and it was just, like it, that chill feeling of just kind of locomotion and movement and just being in tune with what's going on. And, and it's such a hard thing to find now with all the craziness of, you know, the computers and society and all the stuff in the news and, you know, to be able to lose yourself for a little bit 
is extremely valuable. So that was a, it was a hard question to answer. I'm like, I don't even know. Like there was hours where I might not even have thought of anything, but I was in the moment. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe that's how it should be, right? Yeah. Maybe our brain shouldn't always be filled with thoughts and thinking about something. Maybe it's, maybe that busy is busyness, if we can leave it behind, whether it involves having to do a race like that to find a state of calm or sneaking out the door at lunch to get a quick run in. I think that's one of the things that I enjoy about running in general is just, that's my time. That's my yeah. time to be with me, with my body, to be wherever I, I, I can be. And it's a time to quiet the mind if it wants to quiet, to let it run if it wants to run, yeah. but it's there. And it's, it's just, it's become a nice common thread. I mean, if I think about, you know, the last 20 years of my life, pretty much every day I've run. And so it's something that I've done every day for 20 years. And that's kind of cool when you think about it. It's kind of like waking up and eating. It's yeah, it's a neat, it, it's a neat. It's not bread. a bad habit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could be worse, could be worse habits. Well, I definitely, one more question for you, I guess this one is definitely, what's next for you? What's next for the company? Is Are you content with, I guess taking what you have now and growing it, keeping it, you know, I, I, sometimes when things get too big, obviously it, it's not the greatest, but like, what do you see your focus and where do you see it going? It's both great questions. Uh, for the company, the vision is to continue to expand awareness to other runners in the United States. And we have so many runners that run with us today that generates so many great stories that we put back into the community. So it's this wonderful flywheel. And so almost all my efforts are spent on how can I let more people know about Peregrine as a company? How can I let people know more about uh, why it makes a lot of sense for your routine to take a multivitamin? And so that's sort of the main focus. And then personally, I have goals too. Um, I my, my current goal, I don't know if I'll get there, but I'm gonna try. But when I first started running and I ran a marathon, it was close to four hours. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, um, I was never you know, a runner or a fast runner, but it'd be great if I could qualify for the Boston Marathon one day. Uh, and so I've done that. I've run the Boston Marathon. I've qualified now five times or six times, something I never thought that I could go do. Uh, but my current goal is I want to qualify to run the New York City Marathon which is a little bit harder than the Boston qualification standard. And so that's my current focus. And I ran my last marathon and I, I missed it by three seconds. And Oof. so I think, I think it's possible that I could go do it. I just have to have a good training block and, um, and a good day. And that would be the kind of the next big goal for me that I'm trying to put together. So um, I'm looking at, maybe something i don't run well in the heat um i'm a very sweaty salty runner like you were mentioning it's like oh, i it sounds miserable running around Rhode island yeah. or or atlanta this time of year yeah. miserable miserable um but so something in either in the winter or the fall so the races that i like a lot i ran the grandma's marathon recently and that was a beautiful race Yep. I've always wanted to go down to Houston or Disney in January. That would be a great time of year for me. Um, and I've always had a lot of fun going out to California and running CIM. So something like that will probably pop on the radar at some point. Um, so I can get a little bit faster and hopefully make that. Don't epic hide from those. Run. Don't hide from the trails. Do you, do you do any? You're mostly road, or are you a little bit of trail too, or? You know what? It's mostly roads, but it's interesting you mentioned that because we spoke when we spoke about a month ago, you kind of piqued my interest. And then shortly thereafter, I met with another Paragon runner who lives in Atlanta and he is running the Let Go 100, either yep. at the time yep. of recording or very close to it. And I, I said, well, how do you train for an ultra in Georgia, because it just seemed, I was like, how do you, you live in the city? You live in Atlanta. And he, he was like, this is actually the best place to go train. We have Stone Mountain yep. and it, it has about 5,000 feet of gain going up and down the mountain. It's a one mile trail up and down. 
And he's like, a lot of ultra runners will just train hiking and running that. I was like, that's interesting, mainly hiking it. And he's also, there's a lot of technical trails around the mountain, as well as some of the different parks. We have Kennesaw. It's one of those things that I never realized. It's like until you actually sit down and think about it, you, you, you never realize all the different potentials that are out there. And so I've been thinking a lot about it. We're headed up to Kennesaw this weekend for a soccer tournament with the family. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I could sneak out and do something up there. So I will say trail running made me a better road runner. What I then mm -hmm. found out was trail running is obviously a little more technical. You're not dodging traffic. You're dodging boulders, rocks, and tree limbs. Rattlesnakes. Um, rattlesnakes for you. Yep, yep. Um, but it's one of those where I seek out trails more than I seek out roads now. And while I might be, let's say I have an, you know, just round number eight minute mile on the road, that eight minute mile on a, on a trail doesn't exist. It's a 11 or a 14 for the same right. distance. So what I found was that, you know, a heart rate level piece of it for me was trails is always up there. It's just always up there because you're pushing off a lot more. The ground's moving. There's just those little nuances. Um, but when I get on the road, I feel like my legs open up and I'm like, wee, you know, so it's definitely one of those where I, I encourage all and it's, better on the knees for me it's better on the ankles um and it's cooler you know you get under that canopy you get a little bit of shade you know and, and survival mode but uh, i highly encourage people to get in the trails and take advantage especially if you're trying if you're if you're hitting that wall with your road runs mix right. in the trail run here and there and you'll notice a difference i'm gonna try that um how would you would you suggest that let's say i have a um an hour easy run one day mm -hmm. in the training plan, would you suggest taking one of those easy runs and going to the trail and keeping the time the same, even though the distance will be less or keeping the distance the same because, and just say, Hey, it's going to take longer. Um, it, I think it's indifferent. Um, to be honest, you know, I, I think if you're a outdoor road runner and let's say your Wednesday run is a five mile run around the neighborhoods. If you can go find a trail and do three to five miles in the trail, you're going to see that your overall exertion is about the same. Um, for me, I never like to map out my runs. I like to just step out the door and go. So there's times where like I have sneakers, like I love my Cascadia, my Brooks Cascadia 15s. And they're like a hybrid. You, you went on to go do that. Yeah. So I have, I have my Brooks, um, the Cascadia 15s, they're not a heavy lug, so they're not, you know, if you're on the road with heavy lugs, they tend to catch a lot. But these are kind of a nice little hybrid where I can duck in. I'll do two miles on the road, five miles on the trail, two miles back. Like, I'll run to the trails now as opposed to driving there. Um, but then I have straight trail sneakers that I run in all the time, different uh, setups. But it's one of those where, you know, again, different terrains, sandy, rocky, wooded, paths you know sometimes even just those like crushed stone bike paths they're fine um but yeah i would definitely mix it in it's it's one of those where i think you'll notice a difference right away uh it doesn't matter the distance but if it's in your routine and you start to mix that in you're gonna you're gonna see a different interval level a different training level and and i think you'll notice uh an increase in your times all right i'll let you know so, yeah, I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours every time we catch up. It's a great conversation. I would definitely love to do this again and, and keep it a routine, uh, keep, you know, your progress and, and maybe rope you into a run with me one of these days. And uh, again, George, I, I can't say it enough. Uh, great meeting you. Thanks for being on Level Up Run. Uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to visit your site. I'll link to everything below uh, and make you the nutrition stop. Thanks, Matt. Great catching up. Same, same. Reach out anytime. We'll talk soon. See ya.